Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Dear students, welcome to the second day of the EU Week, which is jointly organized by Asche Cedeva and Tim Speaker Series. We are living through a process of tremendous change. Through digitization, every aspect of life will be revisited. Whole industries are being transformed and who is not able to adapt will be disrupted. To combat this, innovation plays an even more important role. We're delighted to have two renovated speakers with us today who will share their insights on how to build powerful EU startups. Mr. Jean-Michel Dahl is professor at Sorbonne University, specialized in economic and management of innovation. Mr. Dahl heads the Agoranov Incubator, which has to date supported more than 450 startups. In 2018, he was appointed to the Innovation Council and in 2021 to the Supervisory Committee of Future Investments by the Prime Minister. Great to have you with us today, Mr. Dai. Mr. Schönberger is Professor and the Vice President for Entrepreneurship at the Technical University of Munich. Mr. Schönberger is Co-Founder and the Managing Director of Unternehmertum, which supports more than 50 high-growth technology startups each year. Furthermore, he is partner of Unternehmertum Venture Capital Partners. Great to have you. It's a pleasure, Felix. Before starting, I want to encourage our audience to post questions you would like to ask Mr. Dahl or Mr. Schönberger on the right side in the chat on the screen. Mr. Sch Mr. Dahl and Mr. Schönberger will each deliver a brief keynote, followed by a moderated discussion, and then a Q&A session. And once you have posted those questions, there's also the opportunity to upvote questions that you are particularly interested. So please, post your questions. And, of course, I need to mention, please follow us on all social media platforms. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, this is now, this was now from my side. And now please welcome Mr. Dahl and Mr. Schoenberg. Mr. Dahl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you all today uh, for various reasons that should become clear as, uh, as well, while I, we discuss and talk this morning. Um, uh, it's a special pleasure because of Europe, of course, and because of the of the discussion we we can have uh, and that we long had between between Germany and France, and to just uh, um, not so much on the question that we are addressing today, not so much on the question of startups. Actually, it's a it's a topic. Uh, so I could just close my keynote now because I have said the, the crux of the argument uh, on which I think that uh, it's a topic that deserves discussions between us a lot more than it has uh, happened in, uh, in, in the recent years. So, I'm, I'm, so I have the pleasure to, to, to be in charge of an incubator in Paris that was founded by several of the uh, prestigious academic institutions in the Paris region. The incubator is called Agoranov. I've been in charge of this for 17 years now. Uh, it takes time to do things uh, in life, as of almost always. Uh, and we were fortunate to build a deep tech, uh, mainly deep tech program uh, that has now given birth to five unicorns. So for those of you who don't know unicorn companies, it's a bit weird, but uh, unicorn companies are uh, companies, startup companies who are, uh, that are worth more than 1 billion euros, uh, dollars, whatever the local currency is, matters. Uh, and this is a way of um, counting the number of fast growing scale ups uh, and so there's, there are 13 unicorns in France currently, and five of which uh, were uh, born at Agoranov, uh, three of them in artificial intelligence, two of them in healthcare, and two of them also in InsurTech, which is the, the new approaches to, to insurance. Um, and something that we are very proud of also is the fact that the startup companies that we've incubated now represent uh, uh, close to 15,000 active jobs, uh, many of which uh, are in just uh, uh, research and development, technical, uh, operation, sales, and uh, many of which, uh, uh, I don't know what the... 
age pyramid would be for those 15,000 jobs, but I'm guessing that there would be a huge spike between 20 and 30. Uh, so we are especially happy to to contribute indirectly, uh, and that would be that would be in a minute my last point. Um, we are especially happy to contribute also to uh, um, a more vibrant economy, notably with respect to job creations and and, and everything. I'm, I'm actually hearing myself uh, now. With a delay. Okay, we hear you very well. Okay, maybe it's better this way. Can you still I'm hear me? Hearing myself uh, now. No, no, I'm I'm definitely hearing myself with, with a, a few minutes delay. So maybe it goes through well. Elon Musk satellites, then back to Earth and to Paris. But uh, uh, and it's a bit annoying. So I'm going to to force myself not to listen to myself, <laughs> okay, <laughs> which is always, I think, a good exercise for the ego myself, not to listen uh, to yourself. No, no, and no, and no, that I'm was about to be to be my point. The, uh, that delay, so maybe the reason why we are so happy is because. Because we were lucky to, to uh, just uh, host uh, uh, quite a few so extremely talented entrepreneurs. No. And um, it, it, I think it's important that uh, uh, we recognize the fact that uh, whatever we do in when coaching startups is based on the talent of the entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think there's, there's much entrepreneurship going on in the younger generation in, in many hubs in Europe, such as Munich and Paris. And I think it's, uh, um, I think it's especially important that we just can connect this way. And I'm stopping here because, uh, to, be, to be honest, it's, it's a nightmare uh, trying not to hear. And I think that I'm giving the floor to, to, to Helmut and I'll, I'll come back during the discussions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much already for those uh, valuable insights. Then, Mr. Schoenberg, would you like to go on? Okay. I I found the solution now. You are still on mute, Mr. Schoenberg. Just so you know. Sorry for that. <laughs> no, 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 I got it. So ho hopefully, can you see my slides also? Yes, now, yeah, now we see that. Cool. Okay, One. so sorry for the delay. And um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for the invitation, Felix and Jean Michel. Um, it's extremely amazing uh, what you achieved with Argonneuf in Paris. So. Um, you mentioned the number of um, helping to create um, five unicorn companies. Uh, I think this is really extraordinary, extraordinary achievement. And this is exactly what Europe is needing. So we need more um, hubs, um, more, more ecosystems where these high growth, high tech companies evolve and can really grow on a global base. And, uh, so just imagine if um, Europe would have um, like um, yeah, 20 or 30 or 40 such places, such entrepreneurship centers, such incubators as Argonneuf um, in Europe, um, Europe would be one of the most entrepreneurial regions in the world. So here at, at TUM and in Munich, we are also pursuing this idea of, of growing these high growth companies. And what's also um, very um, positive is that um, we also have a similar experience as Jean-Michel has. So what happened in the last 20 years was that um, also Munich evolved as a really strong um, tech startup ecosystem. 
And so far, um, our center, um, our incubator um, has um, also built these unicorn companies. Um, we are one behind um, Jean Michel. So um, we have now um, four of such companies. Um, some of them, you know, like Flixbus, um, the, the uh, um, mobility company, which is very successful in serving um, 60 million people and um, is the market leader all over Europe. Or there are other companies with uh, wonderful entrepreneurs like uh, Maria and Dominic who are working in the mech tech sector and improving um, the, the European healthcare system, for example. Or another one, which is um, also a unicorn company, Silonis, which is a data mining company. And um, so they try to improve um, companies all over the world by using the own company data better in a better way to, for example, improve the processes, um, um, procurement systems, and so on. And what, what I think is really wonderful and a great hope for Europe um, in Paris, in Munich, and in many, many other places um, all over Europe, we have all these talents, all these young entrepreneurs with great idea, with great talent, who are ambitious. And what Jean Michel and myself and all our colleagues are doing is um, try to build an ecosystem for these people that they can um, yeah, grow their ideas and become really successful. And how Unternehmertum is doing, so we are a fully integrated entrepreneurship center at the university in Munich at the Technische Universität in Munich. And how we do it is by really building uh, this flow of people. So we have more than 5,000 people per year in our programs. And then these people start to innovate, to do startup projects. And out of this huge flow, about 50 new high-tech companies evolve per year. And they also um, collect a lot of money. So they're not only worth billions, but they also get billions of, of US dollars in, in funding. And this is how you really build up a strong ecosystem. And what we also need, and this is what's also a strength of Europe, we have a fantastic base of established companies. And if you look at all the, the great companies around Paris or around Munich, so they're fantastic family companies, fantastic mid-sized companies, fantastic global companies. And what makes us strong is if the established companies and the startup companies work together. And this is also one of the tasks of our entrepreneurship centers to foster this bridge between the established companies and um, the young companies. And what you see here is um, the, the financing rounds in, in, in our Munich ecosystem. So um, you see tons of, of, um, of teams. On the left side, you have these very small venture rounds. So with business angel money, for example, or small venture capital tickets, where startups maybe get a, a half a million euros. And then to the, to the right, you see the larger rounds, like the Series A, the Series B, the Series C rounds. The Series money is invested like in a, a Series A round, maybe 10 million, or in a later round, really a lot of growth money. For example, like in ESA Aerospace in 75 million last December. And what we have to do as ecosystems is to build this flow of startups and also attract a lot of venture capital our own venture capital. So Unternehmertum, for example, has an own venture capital fund and we manage about 300 million euros and are one of the most successful ICT funds in Europe. And there's also a lot of money coming from other European countries, but also from global investors like from the US and China. Yeah, and last point is, if we want to build high growth companies in Europe, it's a global game. But first, we have to do our homework at home. So um, that's also one point, I think, for the discussion. Let's think about how we can create a better European startup market, a venture capital market, 
also a consumer market where our startups and it doesn't matter if they are from Paris or from Copenhagen or from Helsinki or from Munich have access to this European market and we have fantastic partners like um, our friends in Paris and all, all around Europe from Vilnius to Amsterdam um, to, to um, Milano um, there are all these great entrepreneurship institutions and I think we should um, uh, bundle our strength and work even closer together but it's also a global business and if you look at the, the unicorn companies uh, Jean Michel uh, brought forward or our own uh, they are active on the global market and this means we also have to reach out for example to the uh, US or to um, Asia to China to be really a leading tech company on a global base. And uh, let's bundle the strengths together to play this game as European and um, high tech startups and be yeah, as important as the VC and startup ecosystems, for example, in Silicon Valley or in Beijing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schönberger and Mr. Dahl, for your inspiring keynotes. It, it, it sounds like we have a, have a great time for uh, EU startups ahead of us, as, you, as we saw the graph and, and that, that it's picking up and that we have more and more funding. And my first question would be, like us sitting here today proves that uh, founding has become an important part of, uh, of society and the economy. We have in France the initiative of La French Tech, uh, and now on a bigger level, Scale Up Europe, initiated by the French uh, minister, um, French president Emmanuel Macron. And um, then we in 2018 had in Germany the Gründungsoffensive, uh, offensive, uh, the Gründungsoffensive, a startup campaign. Um, why do you think is entrepreneurship um, among students, but also among policymakers, so popular currently? Said I, would you have an answer to that? Oh, I'm an economist by training and I'm teaching economics, so I don't know. I'm not sure that you want me to, to give a, a lecture on the benefits of entrepreneurship for the, for the economy. Um, so I would answer rather um, as a sociologist. I think that there's, um, of course, the, 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 the economic benefits of having. Uh, more and more uh, startups, uh, economic activity. I think there's a debate currently going on in Europe about this, about whether we are mostly a free market or whether it is needed to have more production on ourselves. And this uh, debate, I think, has uh, gone through long uh, lines that are a bit complex. But uh, what is for sure is that if we want to be able to, to, to afford our uh, social uh, safety system, uh, things that are crucial for Europe, we have to be rich enough to, to afford it in the, in the decades to come. And as an economist and as a citizen, to be honest, I don't think that we will be able to afford it if we don't have enough production on our soil. I think that the free market option as the as a, a kind of inevitable. It's not a it's not a political. What I'm saying, uh, it's a just inevitable consequence of degrading the the living conditions of the of the European citizens. Uh, uh, even if it is slow and we don't uh, we don't notice it, but um, that was the economist point of view with respect to the sociological point of view. I think that the younger generation. Um, has endorsed entrepreneurship in the in worldwide. Uh, anywhere I travel to, be it uh, Tunisia, Singapore, uh, Romania, um, anywhere. I think there's, uh, and I think it is something that has not yet completely been uh, analyzed. But to simply said, uh, I think that um, there's, there are many opportunities in the world today, not only because of technology, but because of the good part of the globalization, meaning that it's easier to travel, it's easier to form international teams, it's easier to do many things. And I think it is, it, uh, so I think that the younger generation has endorsed all of this and taken advantage of this. And it is very highly welcome. 
because I'm not from the younger generation, as you probably would have noticed. And previous times were a little bit more boring in this respect. So I think it is great news that the younger generation has seized the opportunity of being more entrepreneurial. And if I may say some, uh, just one last word, entrepreneurial with respect to the economy, but actually entrepreneurial also with respect to impact and to many other things that are as highly welcome as uh, scale-ups in Europe, by the way. And Felix, may, may I add um, uh, some point for what, what Jean Michel said? It's also really cool to be an entrepreneur, and it's it's really cool to to pursue your, your ideas and your passion. And I personally also had the chance. So Unternehmertum was uh, founded 20 years ago, and it it comes out of my master thesis. So 20 years ago, I did my master thesis, um, writing a comparison between Stanford and our university tomb at, in, in Munich, and came up with the suggestion to start an entrepreneurship center. And uh, one of, of our great supporters, or the most great supporter of Unternehmer, was Susanne Klatten, and um, I pitched it to her. So she's the main shareholder of companies like BMW. And she said, okay, let's, let's try it, but we should do Unternehmertum also as a company. So I had the chance to become an entrepreneur myself and build up Unternehmertum, which is now over 300 employees. And it's, it's really a fantastic journey. And you learn so much and you, you can really put your ideas into practice. You, you find great team members and you learn so much. And so I think it's also so cool and it's, uh, it's a great alternative to yeah, um, staying in academia or in, in, in uh, getting a job in an established company. If I may, Felix, I would second yeah. what uh, Helmut, Helmut just said. And, I, and uh, he, he had very kind words for the work we've done in Paris, but I am very impressed with what has been done uh, uh, by Helmut and his teams in uh, in, uh, in Munich and to just uh, reflect that exactly. So the, the fifth unicorn dates only from last week, Helmut. So uh, it's, uh, okay. Uh, and so, and we have a wall, if you want to go on LinkedIn on my account, for instance, we, we have a wall at Agoranov where we hang unicorn heads. Uh, in paper, of course. So we have we just uh, hung the, the the fifth unicorn last week, and there's someone in my team who came back and who was with me uh, 17 years ago, and we had this exactly this chat about the fact that it was just a 150 square meters without windows. It was a smelling fish because it used to be a place where people were cooking. And that was, that was the incubator at that time. And so we were reflecting back on the history and on the fact of what we have built. And, and, and that's, uh, I think that not only it is a fantastic journey and adventure, but also when you have built something, I would say with your hands, uh, the satisfaction that you get of having built something, I think, is something that has great value, uh, not for, uh, well, paradoxically, uh, I, I'm guessing for uh, you, considering the discussion we've had, and I would hope for me, uh, it does not reflect so positively on a supersized uh, ego. I think that it also, I think it's a satisfaction that allows you to do more things because you see what you have done. And now that you see the house that you've built, you want to move forward. And I think that moving forward with respect to Europe uh, and to the, the, the fact that there are not so many connections between us in Europe, I think it is one, as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the next steps that I would very much like to contribute to, because I think this is our future. This is our absolutely needed future. That, that is great to hear. And it's, it's very nice to hear how, how passionate you are for startups. Um, my next question would be, if it, now we have five against four unicorns, if you could put us in a competition style. I would like to ask you, Mr. Schoenberg, what do you think, and then you, Mr. Da, what do you think is your counterpart's cluster or university better at than the Munich cluster or the Paris cluster? What is, what is Paris doing better than Munich? And what is Munich maybe doing better than Paris? Mr. Schoenberg, would you start? So uh, 
I, I think uh, pa Paris is a, a fantastic um, global city, extremely international, um, um, very, very well connected in the world. Um, also uh, great local companies, um, great um, family um, owned companies, um, and also a huge venture capital ecosystem. And if you look at the numbers, um, how much money is spent in France, um, it's amazing. And especially in, in Paris, Paris is, is the largest hub, the, the biggest hub in, in France. And so um, you, you see um, the, the incredible impact. And just imagine only out of one incubator, Agonerf, five such unicorn companies emerge. So um, this shows the strength and the impact of the ecosystem. And I think what's also uh, very good in, 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 in Paris is um, the very strong um, academic ecosystem, the many universities and research centers. And what I really like is that also within the Paris ecosystem, these institutions work together and also form alliances um, like Partly Tech, for example, um, so I think this is, is great that also the local hubs like Paris are working together, that they are bundling their strengths and bring out unicorns together. And on the other side, stay open, reach out to their friends in Munich and Copenhagen and so on. So this is important and also have a global perspective. I am, I am very impressed uh about the way uh, uh, TUM and, uh, uh, and Untanemu TUM uh, have been able, and that was presented in a, one of the slides that uh, Helmut showed a few minutes ago, has been able to integrate the different aspects of the that are needed in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem, uh, not just uh, incubation. I'm only doing incubation, okay? Uh, previously in my career, I contributed to tech transfer and to venture capital. So I, I, I know the other uh, pieces of the, of the puzzle. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, only, only very, very rarely have I seen uh, a situation where uh, there's been um, a, a very well thought and, and, and strategic uh, initiative that dealt with the many aspects of the, the innovation chain from tech transfer uh, to venture capital and sense in, and, and beyond. This is not something that uh, we have in Paris, to be, to be perfectly honest. I think that many, many institutions uh, uh, are trying to move in this direction and they are uh, definitely uh, just uh, having some success in, in doing so, but I, I don't think that for now we have any institution in the, in the Paris region that has reached this level. Uh, honestly, this is not just praise, uh, very honestly. And I think it is, it is important most probably that, uh, that we, 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 we see this uh, about uh, the, the, the potential. And then, um, to be honest, uh, Paris has a, a road ahead also. Uh, and I think that um, uh, maybe um, uh, some of you listening from German, Germany or elsewhere might be surprised, but uh, I'm, my impression is that the French are not so good with bold moves. Uh, and with respect to startups, uh, we've paid the price on this because we had so many uh, potential champions um, to uh, which we did not provide uh, sufficient support. And by sufficient support, um, I'm telling you not only symbolic support, that, was, that is important, but also tens of millions of euros, hundreds of millions of euros, because the nature of the game worldwide now, um, for many years, the expression mega round has been around, uh, meaning that one, as soon as a company has uh, just uh, enormous cross potential, uh, 
um, the fact that it can raise several hundreds of millions of euros is commonplace. Uh, and if we can't do this, we lose. And we have to be prepared to do this. This is coming. This is coming to Munich. This is coming to Paris. But this is coming um, slowly, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And I think this is something that we need to be. The, the money is there somewhere, somehow. I think that we, we have to be prepared psychologically to just put that level of strength on the most promising scale up so that they can just go fast enough to, to become champions. And this is not something that uh, for now, I'm feeling that my country was, the culture in my country was so much prepared to, to do. And that was, that, was a bit, uh, that was a bit annoying, to be honest. I see, but this is maybe a point where Untanimantum can can go to Aguranov and maybe Aguranov to some point, St. And um, since we have the the European Union week also, and we also want to talk about the strength. So I would like to ask, what, what would you say is internationally seen and worldwide seen? What is the strength of the European tech and startup ecosystem? So, uh, Felix, and I think what we, we already have is we have quite good traction in Europe. And so we have all these wonderful companies growing and also these unicorn companies grow. But as Jean-Michel said, if you compare it um, to our colleagues, for example, in Beijing or in Silicon Valley, uh, there's still a huge gap. So it's a gap of something between five to 10 depending on the reach. So we have to be five times quicker and five times maybe better also in the volume of money invested to really be competitive with these other global players. But what are, what are the strengths? Only, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, and we, so what we have in Europe, it's a, it's a fantastic talent base. So there are fantastic students, researchers, engineers. We have great universities around. But where we have to improve is to get these results better out of these academic institutions and make them to real scalable services and products. And what is important with that is on one side, as Professor already said, is money. So we need uh, more venture capital, especially also in the growth phase, to compete with the, these other Chinese and US high growth companies. And what we also need is a, a strong global market. And so it's not easy for a French company, for example, to win first customers in Germany and vice versa. And I think this is also a job um, Jean-Michel and I and all our colleagues have to do is help also our French startups to get a good market entry, for example, in Germany or our Munich startups get a good market entry in France. Yes, uh, no, definitely. And uh, the fact that it's, uh, if you see the glass half full, you could definitely say that uh, uh, just a few years ago, Europe uh, did not exist. By Europe, I mean EU 27, without the UK, even if I'm very sad to have to utter those words, but still. Um, EU 27 was uh, not that much an interesting area for uh, the global startup scene. This has changed. Uh, EU 27 definitely is a place. Uh, and uh, to be perfectly honest, if um, you would have told me 10 years ago that the situation in Europe would be the way it is now, I would have signed immediately, okay? Uh, because the, the, the things have changed considerably in the right direction. This is for the glass half full. For the glass half empty, this is just rephrasing what Elmus just said. Uh, we have to be 
five times bolder, five times um, quicker, uh, five times bigger in terms of runs. Five times, that's a lot. This is not something that we can achieve by simply patching existing in instruments. I think that there, there, there has to be a, a common understanding uh, that we still have a major step forward to do. It's not a minor step forward. It's a major step forward uh, to, to be just uh, exactly where we want to be. And what I and others have been trying to convince uh, many people at the level of governments and the EU is no single country can do this major step forward. It's just impossible. Only by joining forces uh, can we do this. And again, this is inevitable. This is just uh, mathematics, you know. Uh, and, but this is very, very difficult to convince people about mathematical uh, theorems, uh, okay? Especially in this, uh, in this field. So we have not managed yet because, of course, things are moving at the level of the European Union, of the Commission, at inter intergovernmental level, and the Scale Up Europe initiative that you mentioned, uh, to which both Helmut and I are part of, uh, launched by, uh, by President Macron and Minister Cédric O in, in France, is, is absolutely excellent also because it helps um, building a European community of people. Uh, many Helmuts and many Jean Michels, and also many people from other countries, not just Germany and France. But this is super important. This is super important because if we share uh, the kind of conviction that we are sharing today, I think this is something that can just um, prepare the kind of move that is needed, which is that several countries in Europe do accept to really contribute together to this to this move forward that's that's a that's a very very great vision to have and to hear and and it sounds like things are moving and it sounds like we are getting progress and that we are on a good on a good uh, track and i'd always I'm, I'm i'm the kind of guy who always sees the glass half full so that is nice to to hear that that will scale up, but I'm also excited what it will bring in the future. I, I, if you may, if you don't mind, Felix, yeah. I am also kind of an optimistic person. Most probably, I wouldn't be with you today if I wasn't. Still, I think that we have to be just um, uh, clinical sometimes, uh, and. Um, Sometimes we observe movement, but since I was into math mathematical metaphors, if you wouldn't mind, I'm just going to share with you another one. It's the one about uh, uh, Kylie's and the turtle, okay? And if you don't know this one, uh, you, you should check. Uh, it's um, Achilles and is always getting closer to the turtle. Uh, always moving, but he would never reach the turtle, okay? And this is exactly also, to be perfectly honest, the impression that I have at the level of the EU these days, which is that things are moving, and we are moving always closer to the goal, but we might never reach it, because the speed at which we are moving is not sufficient. Okay. Would, would you agree on that, Mr. Schillenberger? Uh, yeah, I, I think Jean Michel um, bordered on the point. So I think that's extremely important. Maybe to, to make it a little bit more concrete, and also uh, I hope many of the, the stu students um, from, from Paris and Munich and, and all the other countries are, and cities are, are, are listening. Uh, so it's it's about you and your journey. And I think, yeah, look left and right and see um, your great fellow students and where are they coming from? And I, I would love to see more pan-European teams. So for example, with a great um, CEO uh, from France and maybe a great designer from Italy and maybe a great engineer 
um, from 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 Germany and so on. So we, I think, what we we need is to really think more on a European, really European base. And um, so it's nice if if you now a Paris team is visiting in Munich for two two weeks. This is a great uh, step, first step we have to do. But I think we will reach the goal if we have really these pan-European teams, if these teams also think European, if they have European customers all uh, over all these nations, if they have an investor base where uh, the investors are coming maybe from Rome and from Stockholm and uh, f uh, from, from Barcelona and so on. And I think um, we are on the way, as, as Michel described it, with the turtle. And it sometimes feels uh, very slow, but I think we have to move in this direction. Hopefully, um, the, the turtle has a turbo, and it's also up to all of us to, to, to press the turbo button. Thank you very much. That is, that is, a, that is a great, great, um... A great point to make that we need to have internet, uh, European teams. That would be the a great step. Thank you very much. That was now the moderated uh, uh, discussion. Now we have questions from the audience. Um, the first question that um, that was asked by Phil is: Do you expect any consistent changes in global trends related to startups after the pandemic is over? Would you like to start, Michel? As you, as you wish. Uh, I can. For now, at Agoranov, we, uh, but we are mostly exposed to deep tech and B two B startups. Uh, we are not witnessing a negative impact of the COVID crisis meaning that the number of applicants has uh, even uh, increased last year. Uh, and that with respect to VC funding, it is still extremely active. Uh, that said, uh, it is very sector dependent. And uh, for example, uh, startups in tourism or in other sectors that have been heavily affected by the crisis have been suffering a lot. Uh, so the situation is very, very heterogeneous. That's for the, I mean, pragmatic answer. And um, with respect to after, uh, hopefully in the, in the months to come now, uh, it's difficult to, to draw expectation, but um, my, my impression is that the level of frustration, uh, in, especially in the younger generation, is very high, which is pretty understandable. Actually, the level of frustration is quite high in the other generations too. Uh, and I think that this should just uh, probably contribute to the willingness of many people to move forward uh, even more rapidly. That would be my guess, and that would be also my hope, to be to be honest. And then in, in this case, uh, I'm. Sure even more optimistic than you are. So I, I think um, we are now in a golden age of, of entrepreneurship and it's really, perf it's really a perfect situation to start your new company. And the reason is, as Jean-Michel already said, there's a lot of money in the market um, to, to in, be invested. And just to give you the numbers in our ecosystem. So now it's the 11th of May and already over 1 billion euros is invested in our startups this year 2021 so it's an incredible increase in money invested in high growth companies second is um, the if you look at the talent base as Jean Michel already also mentioned um, more and more people really want to work for an agile fast moving company which also has a great impact and as an entrepreneur you have the advantage and the freedom to f to find this impact yourself and make this uh, the stand in in the universe and i think um, more and more people of the younger generation will follow their passion and really try to improve 
um, our world and, and find solutions for the great challenges we have, like climate change. And last but not least, if you look at technology, um, I think it's now the perfect time where you have access to technology. It's a software with, with all the tools you have to, to develop new software, but also hardware. If you look at um, infrastructure like our makerspace, where you can walk in basically and build a rocket or whatever you want to build. And so it's perfect for conditions for the next generation of entrepreneurs. And I think the, the, the biggest limitation is your own drive and, and your own passion. So if you really want to change the world in these times, you really have the, the perfect chance and just apply to such fantastic um, organizations like Argo Nerf to support you and then Hopefully, in, in five years, Jean Michel has another five um, startups, unicorns, and you're one of them. One quick question I'll ask it, uh, Mr. Schoenberger Is your master thesis available to read? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think if you re reach out to, to the Tom speaker series, I can provide it. Um, it's in German, I have to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's 20 years old. So um, at that time, to, just to give you also um, an impression how the ecosystem changed 20 years ago when I was visiting Stanford, the Stanford Entrepreneurship Center had five people. And I came back with the recommendation, let's also try to build up an ecosystem in a startup center with five people. And now, 20 years later, we are far more than 300 full-time employees. And this shows you also how the ecosystem is evolving. And also for Jean-Michel and myself and all our colleagues, we are also on a, on a constant improvement process. And I would say it's nice to read my master thesis 20 years ago, but what's much more important, yeah, think about what you can improve today and, yeah, and yeah, build your own startup or your own ecosystem and for all the our TUM students we, we have a special offer it's called TUM Entrepreneurial Masterclass so um, we give the chance to about a hundred students per year in our ecosystem to write their master thesis about their entrepreneurial topic either for their own startup or for improving the ecosystem and it's just amazing to see these people coming up with all these fantastic ideas so if you are interested in that um, also reach out to me and have a look at the TUM Entrepreneurial Masterclass website. Lisa asked, can students of basic sciences be successful founders or does their field of study harmonize or clash with entrepreneurship? Mr. Dai, maybe what, what is a, also as a university professor, what do you yes. think? <laughs> but uh, no, but if you come, uh, if you come at Agoranov, uh, you should tell her, I think it was Lisa to come uh, to come at Agoranov, but I'm guessing that would be exactly the, the same at Tum. Uh, he, uh, she would meet many people like her because, uh, uh, yes, of course, there's no problem about this. The, 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 the question is more about the team that you might be willing to form around yourself. Uh, and that uh, solo funding, for instance, is uh, statistically associated with many, many difficulties. It's extremely hard to create a successful startup uh, when everything just uh, rests on your shoulders. Uh, and, and, and this is not just, um, uh, I think it's, it, it might, be, might seem both simple and a bit stupid, but really, we, we have a very strong conviction that solo funding is super hard. Uh, and being at least two Dutch changes everything. Uh, and of course, if you are two and you have different sets of skills, one uh, more uh, scientific and technical and the other one uh, more on the business side, even, even better. But I think it's a... a, a not alone. <laughs> uh, and also because part of the pleasure that there is in an entrepreneurial venture has to do with the fact that 
you are a team of founders, okay? And that this is when you talk to the, the founders, I have many, many memories like this. The fact that they were a team and that from scratch, they designed the company working as a team is something that is not only super important for them, but also part of the best memories they have of the, of the entire adventure, because this is just team spirit. Uh, and, and as Helmut said, uh, also changing the world, uh, having impact by yourself. I love this sentence. I think that it is an opportunity to have impact by yourself. Uh, and, the, and this is really, this is really cool, you know? Yeah, and so building a startup is, is team sport, from a shall said it. And another point is, um, what Lisa asked was, um, is a natural scientist or an engineer could be also a good business women and definitely so if i look at our our um, unicorn companies um, most of our um, ceos are um, great um, engineers or natural scientists um, um, great women great great um, men so um, it doesn't matter what you are studying, but it's a matter um, how you can learn. And every day as an entrepreneur, you learn so much. Um, um, one of, of my um, startup friends said, um, it's like doing a fast forward MBA program, starting a company. So you learn on the job every day, you have another problem to solve, but every day you learn. And as Jean-Michel said, you're not alone, but you are in a team and you have to build a winning team as a leader. And it's a, it's a fantastic journey. And one question that also came up is, um, often those startups are founded by men. What do you at Agubanov or Internemedum do to ensure that more there that there are more female founders. Oh, it's a difficult question. At Agoranov, uh, so mainly involved, mainly being involved in the deep tech field, uh, we have uh, twenty five percent women founders, which is mm, not good but not bad uh, if you compare to the benchmark in the field. Uh, also, because uh, many of our founders, to just come back to the previous question have engineering or scientific backgrounds. And uh, at least in my country, uh, this, these are uh, curricula where the proportion of women uh, tends to be way below average. Uh, so um, part of what we can do is, A, of course, contributing to changing the culture, but this is something that is just uh, um, beyond the... Uh, anyone among us that is just something that we can all contribute to. Uh, my team at Agoranov is 60% uh, composed of women. Uh, so as the, the Agoranov team, we are just uh, uh, contributing to, to this very, very concretely. And also we can just do talks like uh, today's, okay? Uh, with respect to the younger generation and just uh, I see no difference. Well, uh, I see no difference in potential between men founders and women founders. Okay, uh, we don't give a damn at Agoranov about the gender. Uh, by the way, we don't give a damn about the age. We don't give about the color of the skin. This has nothing to do with the criteria we could use. And as far as I am concerned, I see no correlation between success and any of these variables, okay? Uh, I think that success is something that is based, that is built individually. And so women have as many chances as men and they should definitely feel uh, as highly welcome as we can in, I would believe, both at two men at Agarano. Yeah. I that is that is great to yeah. hear. Yeah. And, and so what we at Tum and Unternehmertum doing is also we, we have an own network called um, 
and women and entrepreneurs. And um, so uh, when we are seeing more and more um, female entrepreneurs now starting, and I think what really now is changing the, the whole culture and the ecosystem is that we, are, we now have um, experienced successful female entrepreneurs like I, uh, uh, Maria I mentioned in the presentation with Inveox. Um, so she's a great, for example, one, one of our great female entrepreneurs and Maria is then coming back um, in the universities, in the lectures and telling about their success stories and I think this makes a huge difference also um, for the younger female students to see these role models, these successes, and then um, see, okay, this is all possible. And now we see it in all these classes, like in, in um, the Two Entrepreneurial Masterclass, for example, where we, I think, have now um, about 40% female students, which is uh, fantastic. And last point, also, Jerusalem, we also have over 50% of our team members at Unternehmer Tum are also female. So we have them more female Unternehmer Tum team members than male. I just want to mention, because Helmut is right, in, in, in France uh, and Paris and in France, we, we also have the sister initiative that is exactly uh, a network of uh, high profile, successful women entrepreneurs, including several friends of mine uh, who are just pushing very hard in this direction and providing role models to every uh, female founder who wants to join and providing role models and support. And this is, this is also super important. That's, that's very good to hear. Um, one more question um, would be, do you see any future megatrend of importance that we are currently not aware of in the startup and tech scene? This is for you, Helmut. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually there are uh, all these obvious technology trends now coming up and I only want to mention to, um, two things, uh, which is um, quantum computing, for example, or also still the buzzword artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so I think everybody heard of this buzzword, but now it's uh, the window of opportunity to really put these technologies into practice, build applications, scale these applications and build new dominant companies. And if I look uh, to our friends in China or in the US, um, there's a lot of things going on right now in these fields. And I hope that, and I'm certain that also many European uh, startups will take this chance and yeah, let's work hard for it and uh, also cross the fingers that um, out of this global game, also many more global European market leaders will evolve. Definitely. And uh, you know, I, I don't think that I have anything to add to this. Uh, simply uh, something that is a, a bit of a, of a compliment. Uh, many startups, many successful startups, uh, when they are founded, uh, are founded uh, on original ideas that do not correspond to a trend. Uh, because it's a trend in the making. It will be a trend uh, five years later when suddenly people will realize connecting the dots that this, oh yes, this was a trend. And we've seen this happening so many times uh, because we were accepting startups uh, because we thought that they had very strong potential. Mm, this, not with respect to any existing trend, just based on their own qualities and eventually there was a trend on this. So uh, all the more so when you create a company based on new approaches and technologies, um, I mean, you're, you're welcome to be bold, okay? And, uh, and something, and to just uh, say things that you, that you would believe and that not everybody is believing yet. Uh, that might come, that might not come, 
Uh, and if it comes, you'll be the, the winner because you would have started well in advance. And if it doesn't come, uh, to just uh, uh, just to quote Helmut a few minutes ago again, uh, there would have been the adventure and the journey and the learning. Uh, meaning one, meaning that you would have never been bored for many years. You would have learned a lot. And all of this learning, even if your first startup is not successful, you would invest it in your next startup job position attitude in life and this is just something that you, you, you that you keep uh in the in this respect so you should do one it. final question i would have before we come to an end because we already the time is time is already up and um, i would ask you to what is your positive vision for an entrepreneurial europe and for the next big eu powerful eu startups Mr. Schoenberger, would you maybe? Okay. So, so I totally believe in Europe. I believe in all these great creative young people. And these are people who are really not only want to, to create value, but they also want to create really a sustainable future um, for our continent and our world. And I think this is the European spirit. And we see it now with... Um, the new European Bauhaus initiative of the European Commission, where it's about being successful and building new companies, being innovative, but also um, have a, a go good social balance, include people, and also contribute to, to a sustainable future. And I think this is a, a fantastic vision for Europe. And I think it's up to us all to contribute to this vision. And hopefully, um, many new great startups with great unicorns will come out of Europe um, who contribute to this vision of a sustainable and wealthy Europe. I would follow along those lines. Uh, I think the European culture is very open to creativity. This is a value for... Uh, for for us for many of us uh just as the different uh implementations depending on the countries but still uh and uh, creativity values everything like this we have to make sure that uh, startups uh fit completely in this uh, uh framework uh that the the vision we have of the future of uh, europe actually includes everything that has to do with startups and entrepreneurship which is not really the case yet uh i mean it's in the to be honest uh, when i go to brussels i I'm, it's in the discourse always okay uh, I can count the many times when entrepreneurship, innovation and everything is just, but I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that we should ask people to draw a picture, you know, give them a pen and a pencil and then a, a sheet of paper and tell them, okay, just uh, draw me the future of Europe. I'm not sure that whenever they would do this, there would really be a place for startups. In French, uh, I've been trying to say that les startups doivent avoir droit de cité. They, they, they have to be part of the city uh, in a kind of philo philosophical sense. And I think that the economic success is a necessary condition, but success with respect to impact is a sufficient condition. I don't think that we can manage to really plug this aspect of creativity that is associated with startup into the European mindset until we have made clear to everyone that just a, a unicorn startup, successful startup, they do not only uh, succeed economically. They also have an impact on our world. And for many of them, for most of them, they tend to make it better. And I think that people have to be convinced about this. Uh, and before we have really made it, made it convincing, uh, we are just struggling against something that has to do with mentality. So, yes, I would believe that the future of Europe has much to do with startups. We, have, we still have a little bit of a convincing job to, to do. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. This is, 
this is it's so nice to see you so passionate about the the startup world and the future of the European uh, startup world. And um, we hope you all enjoyed it to the audience and that you drew many inspirations from it. Many thanks to you, Mr. Dahl, to you, Mr. Schönberger, you for, your, for taking your time and sharing so many insights with us. It is really, it's really great to see, to see um, your passion and to also know to let's build a European startup and let's, let's do it and let's found with a European team and use the European creativity. Um, we wish you and uh, Agurovno, respectfully, Unternehmensum, all the best and are excited for the next powerful EU startups. Thank you. Dear audience, thank you for joining and make sure to take part now in the other events of the EU week. The next one from us is Peter Kurte, CTO from Siemens at 3 p.m. Stay keen. This is Tim Speaker Series. Thank you very much.